our last session, we'll have the sort of in, improvised uh, panel discussion uh, or questions and answers. Um, so hugely grateful to uh, Joanna, Catherine, uh, Matt and Sean uh, for agreeing to, to do this uh, ad hoc uh, and, and, and on the hoof. Um, I'm aware that, uh, and I think for people at home, hopefully you can uh, have a good view of us. Uh, we've adjusted the camera uh, and the seating, so hopefully um, you, you can see uh, the, the panel here. Um, for people at home, if you make sure that you have in the view, where on the top right-hand side of your screen, it says view, if you go to that and tick speaker view, uh, then, the, then our uh, screen uh, should become the dominant screen rather than just us being one small screen amongst uh, 50, 40 or 50 other ones. So just tick speaker view. Uh, if we, as I said, if we start with some of the questions uh, that we didn't have time for earlier after Catherine's talk. So I'm now going to do again my uh, quota of exercise for the day. Um, Sprint up the staircase. Okay, right. All right. This is actually uh, for Matt. Um, if the princes in the tower followed the same pattern as the Mortimer boys, then they would have emerged from confinement at some point. Why didn't they come back into the public light as the Mortimers did if they were still alive? I think essentially the short answer to that is because Richard III dies at Bosworth sort of two years into his reign. So whatever plans he may have had for the long-term future of the princes would have been thrown up in the air then. When Henry VII comes to the throne, he's promised to marry their sister, Elizabeth of York. And as part of that, he has to re-legitimise the children of Edward IV. So he has to undo that illegitimacy that was established in 1483. And at that point, he hands a, a much better claim than his own to the princes in the tower if they're still alive. So at that point, whatever plans Richard has may have had have to be abandoned. And it becomes about protecting the boys from the, the gaze of Henry VII then, I guess, because he would have an interest in at very least getting them into custody. And I would argue that they do emerge because I, I think, you know, I think Edward V is involved in the Lambert Simmel affair in 1487. And I think Perkin Warbeck was the genuine Richard Duke of York. So I'd suggest they do emerge into the public eye again. It's just that the Tudor government manages to paint them both as, as pretenders, as a bit of a joke. Okay, th thanks, Matt. Uh, now, there's a sort of comment question from uh, Alison Harrop, uh, which I'm hoping you can interpret, Matt. Uh, Alison says, can you mention Philippa's forthcoming book, Channel 4 documentary, and the Yorkshire branch event to all the members here? <laughs> that, that is some quality hijacking of a Mortimer History Society event. <laughs> Well, we, we sometimes hijack Richard III, so we'll, we'll let you get away with it. Fair enough, return the favour. Um, yes, so Philippa Langley is, uh, has a book coming out in the middle of November, which is essentially the results of the first five years of work of the Missing Princes Project. So this has been a project to go into archives around the UK and around continental Europe to look for any evidence of what might have happened to the princes in the tower. Um, there is a documentary to accompany that, which I believe is due out around about the same time. I don't think there's a date yet, but the second half of November. And that is Philippa and Robert Rinder. Kind of she's, she's dragging him around, trying to convince him and his loyally scepticism that there's uh, some potential for the things that she is trying to describe. I have to be so careful what I say. <laughs> um, and there, then Philippa is speaking to the, the Yorkshire branch of the Richard III Society on Saturday, the 2nd of December in York at the Yorkshire Museum, um, which I think will be her first public speaking engagement to talk about the results and the, and the things that are going to be revealed in the book, which is all subject to a non-disclosure agreement <laughs> at the moment. So I have to be really careful what I say. Right. Th thanks, Matt. Um, 
And again, a question for, for you from Elizabeth. Um, I, I have read that two skeletons of young boys were found in the tower in modern times. Does that have any credence? Uh, so these were discovered in 1674 during some building work at the Tower of London. And I mean, uh, th that is a whole other talk in itself. There is lots of context in which those remains were found, which is important. But essentially, Charles II hears about these remains. We, from the counts we have, they're dug up from something like 10 foot beneath the foundations of a stone staircase. Um, and... And if you follow Thomas More's story, not only does he say that they're moved from there, but he says, you know, someone buried them there in the middle of the night and no one noticed. And if you can dig 10 feet under the stone foundations of a staircase on your own in the dark and nobody can notice it, then good luck to you, because I couldn't. <laughs> um, but Charles II, for, for I think contemporary political reasons, hears about these remains. They're thrown on a rubbish heap. He sends people down to collect them back up. It's all put in a box. It's kept somewhere for about five years. And then the, the marble urn that's in Westminster Abbey today is commissioned by Sir Christopher Wren, which is designed by Christopher Wren. And Charles II has it put there with this big Latin inscription on the outside that says, these are the, the remains of the princes in the tower who were murdered by their wicked uncle. And as I said, I think there's lots of political, contemporary political reasons why Charles wanted to talk about tyrants and the, the murder of innocent kings. He considered his own father to be an innocent king who was murdered by a tyrant, Oliver Cromwell. And then you need a, a kind of hero to come and save the kingdom again. So uh, I think you have to place them in that context. There have been dozens of sets of remains found in the Tower of London. I don't think there's anything more convincing about these ones than any of the others. One of the sets of remains that was found was, was lodged in some beams at the top of one of the towers uh, and was confidently proclaimed to be those of Edward V, who must have died trying to escape from the tower until it turned out that they were the remains of one of the tower menagerie's apes that had <laughs> got stuck up there. Um, when the, the moat was drained in the tower, there were remains found in there that people talked about being the princes in the tower. I suspect, given the, the depth that they were found at, I think they might have been there before the White Tower was even there. I think they might be Anglo-Saxon, perhaps even Roman, but we don't know. So th they, there are remains in that urn, we have Richard III's DNA now. We also have the mitochondrial DNA of the prince's mother, Elizabeth Woodville. Potentially, we might be able to answer whether those are the remains of the prince in the tower. There are moral questions about whether we should. Should we go fiddling around in that just to satisfy our own curiosity? Um, and I think examining those remains may answer some questions, but I don't think it can ever answer all of the questions that we have about the princes in the tower, because if, if it is them, it doesn't necessarily prove who killed them. And if it isn't them, it doesn't mean Richard III didn't murder them in 1483. It just means he put the bodies somewhere else. And, and I kind of think as well, burying them at the tower is, is peak Brookside. It's burying your bodies under the patio in the back garden. It's just, it doesn't make any sense to me when you've got a lovely river outside and a great big channel waiting there. I don't know why you would bury them there. So I don't think they're the princes. <laughs> Uh, th thanks, Matt. I, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, for people at home, I'm this sort of disembodied voice uh, <laughs> that, uh, ap appearing uh, off screen. Uh, but I'm just sort of halfway up the auditorium uh, looking at the uh, chats uh, that have come in during the day. Uh, I'm just, uh, as Clive is just scrolling through them, uh, just many people um, thanking us for, for wonderful talks and thanking the speakers for four wonderful talks uh, and commenting on how stimulating they have been uh, and, and how much they have enjoyed them. And so I, I'm just picking out some of the comments, questions. Um, one from Liz, because I think this could be something sort of interesting for the all four speakers to comment on. Uh, so our new member who joined this morning, uh, and this is a reflection on Catherine's talk uh, she says, what a wonderful conundrum. On one hand, you want to accept history as given. On the other, what an amazing postscript to Edward II's reign. So I want to just open it up to any of the four speakers to reflect on that phrase. On the one hand, you want to accept history as given. Is, is, can, can we ever accept history as given? Catherine? Um, well, I suppose for me, what's been really fascinating about my research on Edward II over the last 
gosh, it must be what, 18 or 19 years I've been researching Edward II now. And probably like most of people, like most people who, who know anything about Edward II, I assume that he did die by red hot poker. I mean, I, know, I studied medieval history at university and knew almost nothing about Edward II except as the disastrous king who came between two much, much more successful kings, his, his father and his son. And all I knew about Edward II was basically Piers Gaveston and a red hot poker. And just uh, researching his reign in depth and looking, going back to the original documents over the last few years, it's just been fascinating to me actually how much of the, the story of his reign uh, actually is not true at all. Or, you know, it was based on the misunderstandings of later chroniclers. And in, in a lot of cases, it's just been flat out invented in later centuries. Um, for example, there's this often repeated story, which I see constantly everywhere, that uh, in 1308, shortly after Edward married Isabella of France in Boulogne, that he gave all, all her wedding gifts uh, to Piers Gaveston, and that Gaveston kind of walked around, you know, flaunting himself in front of the queen, you know, wearing her own jewels. I mean, this was invented at the end of the 19th century. It's based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. You know, like uh, there's one chronicler of the time who does actually say that Edward sent his own wedding gifts that he'd received from his father-in-law, Philip IV of France, to Gaveston in England. But it doesn't say that Gaveston was supposed to keep them. Gaveston was Edward's custos regni, keeper of the realm or his regent. So most likely it's just this very boring situation where Edward had received some rings and some war horses from his new father-in-law and then sent them just to Gaveston in England just to, you know, to keep them safer for, uh, for him. And then somehow all these hundreds of years later, people invent this silly story that he's given Isabella's wedding jewels to Gaveston. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. And then people like them make assumptions about the kind of person that Edward II was, you know, based on these, well, what are lies essentially? I mean, I don't mean that people who, who perpetuate this story know that it's a lie because people hear it so often that they assume it must be true. But this is just an example to me of actually going back to the original documents again, this is not based on any, any evidence whatsoever. You know, there's another story about Edward that was invented in the late 1970s, that uh, he took Isabella's younger children away from her custody in 1324. Again, this is just based on nothing. I mean, the, the writer who came up with this story cites uh, a document which doesn't even belong to 1324, it's years older than that. And he cites membranes 14 to 15 of this document, which I have held in my own hands in the National Archives, and it has eight membranes. So again, it's just this silly story. And then it just creates this entirely false impression about the kind of person who Edward II was, and the kind of relationship that he had with Queen Isabella, which was far more complex and actually far more interesting than some silly made up story of, you know, oh, the horrid gay king who neglected his sad, lonely wife for his male lovers. I mean, it's just far more interesting and complex than that. And my aim for, you know, nearly two decades now, there's just been to actually show that we don't, you know, we think we know someone, but we, all we know is just like this one dimensional caricature that's been made of him. And I would never say in a million years that Edward II was a good king. Of course he wasn't. He was a disaster in every possible way. But his reign is fascinating and dramatic. And he is a fascinating person. And I just would like to, to show that by actually going back to the documents and actually then showing readers and, and listeners that no, history isn't a given that it's often just been a story that's been made up over time. And I think I would just add to that, that I think there is an attraction in, in history being the comfortable pair of slippers that we put on in front of the fire, that we know and we understand it, and it helps us be rooted in who we are and where we are. But I also think that, that history as a, a subject is about questions. It's about asking questions of what you're reading when you look at a source, you should always be thinking, you know, who wrote this? When did they write it? Why did they write it? What do they want me to understand from what they're writing and what is their motive from that? And I think if we stop asking questions and just start accepting everything as a given truth, then perhaps we've lost the real meaning of history. Yes, it's stories, but it's also questioning those stories and our understanding of them. And it will constantly evolve. And I think we're still I think to some extent we're still trapped today in a very 19th century Whiggish view of history that has Edward I and Edward III as brilliant kings because they went around bashing foreign kings and desperately trying to colonize everywhere on the, in, the, in the world. And we think of people like Edward II and Henry III as terrible kings because they had pretty peaceful relationships at home. They were nice guys who had hobbies. I mean, we, we might kind of feel like we wouldn't want a prime minister who behaved in the way that Edward I does, 
We quite, might, might quite like Henry III as a prime minister, but we're still trapped in this Whiggish view of what makes a good and bad king in history. And even that, I think, needs questioning. Yeah, all, all I would say on this is that uh, from my own research, uh, looking at the act of the bishops of Bangor, it, it really depends on the writer and the audience. Who are they writing for? So in Anian's case, he's saying that Llewellyn Ap Griffith, the Prince of Wales, is tyrannical. Um, but he's saying this for an English audience. And Llewellyn Ap Griffith will never know that he's being described as tyrannical. Uh, all his ministers are, are satanic uh, and malevolent. They will never know that because these are private letters. Uh, and furthermore, the Dean and Chapter, are they really incestuous adulterers? Uh, perhaps they are, but they will never know uh, that their own bishop has said this of them. So I think it very much depends on the writer and the audience. Yeah. And I think leading on from that, I'd want to say that history is always being written according to what is useful for that mm. time mm. Um, and the perception of the world at that time. And so as a historian of women, uh, one of the things that I you know, keep finding is like, you know, how did they miss out all these women at the time? You know, earlier historians haven't bothered to put them in because they felt they weren't important and yet, and yet they were. Um, and obviously, you know, we're really missing the history of um, the poorer people, you know, the more marginalized people, and you have to work much harder to be able to tell those stories. But once you start doing that, again- uh, Sorry, can I, sorry, way. sorry, Jen, just, uh, Sophie's just saying to me that she thinks that that microphone has got switched off on the side. Uh, it's got a green light on it. Maybe I just didn't hold it close enough. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I've forgotten where I was now. Sorry. Um, uh, oh, yeah, just, yes, just that we're not getting, uh, yeah, we don't have women's history. We don't have marginalized people's history in the way that we could have. So really don't, I, I don't want to accept history as given because because I want to know more and I want to, to find ways of, of discovering those stories that haven't been told yet. I, and I think the the other uh, trap that people can fall into uh, is to forget that whenever we are writing about that event events that or even only happened a short time ago, but certainly events that happened six, seven, eight hundred years ago, we're doing so with the benefit of hindsight. Um, and because uh, Catherine and I were, were, were discussing this yesterday, um, and because from our vantage point, we, it's, it, it's far too easy to assume cause and effect uh, and to think, well, if they did that, they must have known that that was going to follow. But no, of course, they didn't. These, as people have already commented, these are real people often faced with unprecedented, unique uh, circumstances and are working it out uh, as, as they go along um, and don't know what's going to happen next and are just making best of the hand that is in front of them uh, and moving from one situation to another. People, you know, in terms of some of the, uh, com some of the talks that joined today in terms of the forced abdication of Edward II. That was unprecedented uh, to, in, in, certainly since 1066, uh, it was unprecedented to uh, remove uh, a, a, an anointed king. And so of course, the people involved in that uh, were uh, having to you know, work it out as they went along. Um, and and you know, it's too easy for us looking back to just assume that people you know, were aware of the consequences of, of what they were doing. Of course, of course they weren't. They were just people caught up in circumstances uh, often. Um, so, yeah, so as, as Philip mentioned, he and I were, were talking yesterday about the problem of hindsight when we apply it to history, because, of course, it's so easy for us to look back 700 years and think Edward II was forced to abdicate in 1327. And somehow everyone knew that that was going to happen and it was somehow inevitable. But, of course, it was unprecedented. 
And Roger Mortimer, the first Earl of March, is often treated as though like he was always going to be the man who brought down Edward II, as though this was his inevitable fate all his life. And you know, even when Edward uh, uh, imprisoned him in the Tower of London, this was because Edward knew that he was his most dangerous enemy uh, who was going to bring him down one day. I mean, of course, Roger was a high-ranking baron, but so were lots of other high-ranking barons who, who uh, rebelled against Edward in, in 1322. And I often get the feeling with, with history, especially with Edward II's reign, that it's as though everyone living through those events somehow knew how they were going to end. And they knew that like, oh, if we do this, it'll lead to this, and then it'll lead to this. It's as though people taking part in step one somehow knew what step 10 was going to be, when in fact, it's more like a series of dominoes falling, of course. We did this, we make a short-term decision to do such and such, and then that leads inexorably to the next point, and that goes on to the next point. But you don't know when you're in 1322 what's going to happen in 1327. And I, I've seen this as well, for example, with Queen Isabella, Edward II's wife, because of course we know that her son uh, Edward III ended up claim, claiming the throne of France in 1337. Isabella was in France in 1314 and was possibly responsible for uncovering, uncovering the adultery scandal where two of her three sisters-in-law uh, were found out to have had lovers. And I've actually seen it written in a book that Isabella did that on purpose uh, so then that she would disinherit her son's children so that her son one day could claim the throne of France. I mean, this is, you know, idiotic. You know, Isabella came from the Capetian dynasty, which had ruled France since the late 900s, you know, like for more than what more than 300 years before Isabella was even born and she had three sons who were all married and all had children but somehow she knew that all of those children were going to die young because her three brothers sons actually all did die young and that her son would therefore one day be able to claim the throne of France so again it's as though people know the ending of the story and then they, and then they act you know 25 years earlier uh, as though they actually knew what, what was going to happen. Uh, sorry Matt can I, can I just uh... Come in there, please, because uh, a question that has just come in recently um, is, um, would Catherine agree that we should question our traditional ideas around the relationship between Mortimer and Queen Isabella, and maybe question that sexual relationship existed between them, especially as early as in France, which it was again something that Catherine and I talked about <laughs> yesterday. Well, I'm, I'm not really convinced that Queen Isabella and Roger Mortimer actually were lovers. I mean, you know, I'm not saying they didn't go to bed together at some point, but I, I think that was kind of a minor element of, that, of their relationship. I think when they, that when they met in France in late 1325 or early 1326, they basically, neither of them could go back to England. Um, Isabella had been sidelined by Hugh de Spencer, uh, the younger, who was Edward II's co-ruler, and she'd given Edward an ultimatum, like, you must uh, send de Spencer away from court or I won't return to you, and my son won't either, because their son, the future Edward III, who was only 13 at this point, was, was with her in France. And I think that Isabella thought that even if Edward II rejected her, he wouldn't reject their own son. In fact, Edward refused the ultimatum and refused to send the Spencer away. So basically left Isabella with little choice but to, to remain in France. And Roger Mortimer, of course, uh, as we know, was, was in France at, at that time. Uh, he'd, been, uh, he'd escaped from the Tower of London in 1323. And he also wanted nothing more than to go home. He'd lost his lands, his income, his family. He was basically a penniless fugitive on the continent. So he and Isabella uh, realized that they could use each other to get back home. So Mortimer could regain you know, everything that he'd lost. Isabella could regain her lost position as Edward II's wife. And most importantly, uh, as the powerful politician and intercessor and mediator and power broker that she had been up to that point until Hugh de Spencer came along and basically shoved her out of the way. So their political aims coincided very much in 1326. And we actually have no idea at what point they decided to get rid of Edward II uh, rather than just getting rid of the dispensers, uh, Hugh de Spencer and his father. It may be that until, you know, as late as Hugh de Spencer's execution or even afterwards that they thought, oh, you know, maybe that's it we'll just get rid of dispenser uh, and then you know maybe you know edward ii will continue to reign you know isabella will be a powerful politician again and roger mortimer can be one of the, the king and queen's chief counselors and i think just perhaps after that things just snowballed and it became apparent that edward ii after all his disastrous years of, of misrule had actually lost the support of, of pretty well the entire political class of of the country 
So um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, yes, if, if Roger and Isabella, you know, they maybe did go to bed uh, together at one point. But in, in a way, I actually find it quite diminishing of Isabella, the way that she's often written about these days. As though that, fe you know, she was a powerful woman. And it's as though that she can't possibly have achieved anything unless she had a man by her side. And that she was, like, ruled and dominated by her feelings. I mean, not so much that she wanted power, but though she was just in love with Roger Mortimer. And he was so awesome. And he rescued her from this awful marriage, this awful gay man. And I, and I think it's very diminishing. And I think, you know, if we look at modern female politicians, like let's say, for example, Liz Truss, okay, I know, she, you know, her very short tenure as, as prime minister. And then she promoted Kwasi Kwarteng to chancellor of the exchequer. So she promoted him from a fairly junior minister. I think he was environment minister uh, to one of the great, the four great offices of state. And then just imagine in a few hundred years time, people go, oh no, Liz Truss only did that because she was in love with Kwasi Kwarteng and wanted to promote him. And it was all about lust and fear feelings and nothing to do with actually, you know, with, with actual power. Um, so I think, again, like the relationship of Queen Isabella and Roger Mortimer is like the relationship of Isabella and Edward II. It's far more interesting and far more three-dimensional than it's often been, been portrayed. And, and I think, like, as, as um, Joanna was just saying, that, you know, women have often been marginalised and Isabella has often been written about, but I think she's been written about in a way that diminishes her and belittles her and treats her as someone who is just completely ruled by her feelings and, and her lust. And it wasn't like that at all. Right, I mean, can we, sorry, wait, is it a quick comment, Matt? Yeah, I was only really gonna to add to that. I think um, whether or not Isabella and Roger Mortimer had a sexual relationship is kind of the least interesting thing about them, but we seem to talk about it an awful lot. We are weirdly obsessed with royal <laughs> sex lives. Um, medieval monks were keen to blame women for everything that went wrong because they were driven by lust and utterly obsessed with sex. And I'm not sure we've moved too far away from that. Anytime a woman does something, you must have been motivated by a passion for a man, yes. as if a woman can't just act on her own agency. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, we, again, we have a weird idea of the sex lives yeah. of medieval kings. <laughs> what, what, what indeed. Um, although I suppose it, 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 in our defence, uh, it, you know, again, it, 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 it was uh, common parlance at the time. As, as Catherine has said, there is, there is actually no evidence that Mortimer and Isabella had a sexual relationship. Uh, what's the interesting question is why was it that people put about that it was? And what does that say about people? And I, th I think if you look at Eleanor of Aquitaine, you know, constantly accused of having affairs with her own uncle, mm. her future yes. father-in-law, cheating on her yeah, husband all right. of the time. Constantly, we have to have women yes. being, you know, being the cause of problems because they lead men astray. Yes, because yeah. as, soon, as soon as as soon as Isabella refused to return to London uh, from the French court, it was put about in London uh, that Isabella and Mortimer were lovers. Uh, and, and I think that's because they can't put about that Isabella is yeah. assuming some of her own power here. She's yeah. acting on her own agency with some authority and yes. challenging her husband. Yeah. It must just be because she's having sex with a man. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, right, well, I'm going to move us on to uh, an, quite another uh, very big question, uh, which probably will be answered partly by Sean, partly by myself. Uh, and the question is, was there a rivalry with the Mortimers, between the Mortimers and the Welsh princes, as the Mortimers appear to have a role in the downfall and demise of Llywar in the last. Uh, <laughs> now that could take us well uh, past 4.45 uh, and well into the uh, mid-evening. Because um, yes, the, I mean, if I just set the context, uh, Sean, uh, as Sean was saying earlier, uh, Roger Mortimer and Llywelyn ab Griffith were first cousins, both grandsons of Llywelyn ab Yorowith, Llywelyn the Great. Uh, and so indeed, uh, and they were both of a similar age uh, and throughout their life had a tumultuous uh, re relationship. Uh, sorry, Llywelyn ab Griffith was the elder, um, but as Roger Mortimer uh, grew to adulthood, then uh, they had a tumultuous relationship, and certainly, in many ways, Roger could be regarded uh, as his, as Llewellyn's nemesis. Uh, but yes, Sean, do you want to just uh, add to that in terms of the rivalry? <laughs> yeah, everything everything you say uh, it, it is so true, Philip. Uh, what I I'd like to turn it around and ask you a question because I think you are the expert on Roger, Roger Mortimer uh, and indeed his relationships with with uh, Llewellyn at Griffith. I wonder why. 
they entered into an agreement in October 1281, <laughs> after all that animosity. Uh, and I, I, I don't think there's a clear answer to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, just for, for, for people, the, um, I mean, the key, the key sort of uh, conflict uh, between Roger Mortimer and Clarin um, started in terms from a military point of view, started when, as uh, Sean said in his talk, when Llewellyn seized the commote of Guerfinion, uh from Roger Mortimer. Um, and that was then followed up by his seizure of Builf, of which Mortimer was the custodian. Mm. Uh, and then in 1262, Llewellyn, uh, well, initially the local people of Malienif seized the Mortimer castle of Kefin Cleese. And when Mortimer came to its rescue, uh, Llewellyn then arrived with his army uh, surrounded uh, Kevin Cleese and hauled Roger Mortimer up. And whilst Roger was holed up, uh, he then uh, Llewellyn rampaged through the marches, destroying a number of Mort Mortimer castles. Uh, and then finally, when there was the Treaty of Montgomery, that had ambiguities in it, mm. particularly relating to Malienith and the Mortimers. Uh, and those ambiguities were part of unravelling the Treaty of Montgomery mm. and then the further disputes over Kevin Cleese. Part of, but so part of the answer to your question, Sean, is I think it's a more complicated quest, uh, situation than the one I have just run through. Because if we go further back in time to 1241, uh, so shortly after the death of Llewellyn uh, Abjorowulf, who during his uh, rule had established his control over all of Wales, including uh, the lands of Malienif and Guerfunion, uh, and had taken them off, taken them from the Mortimers, uh, and, and had established his control of those lands. Llewellyn's uh, empire uh, dissipated following his death, and by 1241, the Mortimers were active and had, had reclaimed much of Malienif. And in August 1241, we have a series of charters uh, through which some of the leading Welsh nobles of Malienith and Guerfunion quick claim their rights in Malienith to quick claiming their rights to Ralph Mortimer, Roger's father. And amongst those quick claims is one by Llewellyn ap Griffith, uh, quick claiming all his rights for in, perpetu in perpetuity to Ralph Mortimer and his heirs to his lands in Malienith and Guerfunion, because he had been given uh, lands there by his grandfather. But what I find interesting is that in exactly the same month, August 1241, then uh, Llorin's mother, Sanana, uh, reached an agreement with Henry III uh, because following the death of uh, Llewellyn, uh, uh, the, uh, at, well, at the point of uh, Llewellyn's death, he had two sons. Uh, Llewellyn, during his lifetime, had favoured the succession of his younger son, Daffif, um, who was his, the son of his marriage to Joan, uh, who was the well, started life as the illegitimate daughter of King John, uh, but King John did legitimise her. Um, and Llewellyn had favoured uh, Daffith as his successor, which was contrary to Welsh law and custom, uh, because Welsh law and custom would have given equal rights to his elder son Griffith, uh, the son by a long-term relationship prior to his marriage to Joan uh, with a woman uh, known as Tanghwistel Goch. Um, and uh, under Welsh law and custom, Griffith was just as entitled as Daffith. And so uh, Llewellyn had angered many people in Wales for favouring Daffith. Uh, so following the death of Llewellyn, Daffith had imprisoned his brother Griffith. So Griffith's wife, Sinanna, uh, petitioned Henry III for Henry to intervene and secure the release of her husband from imprisonment by Daffith. The agreement that was reached 
And as part of that, Sir Nana pledged a, a payment of a large sum of money uh, to secure her husband's release. And the first signatory to that agreement, pledging to honor that payment is Ralph Mortimer. Uh, now you could say that at this point, Ralph just has an interest in causing trouble and driving a wedge between uh, Grif Griffith and Daffith. But another way of looking at that is that Ralph was a uh, brother-in-law of Griffith because uh, Gladys Fee, who the, the speakers have talked about, Ralph's wife, we know that she was the daughter of Llewellyn Abiorworth, but there is no record of who her mother is. Um, it's quite often supposed that she was a daughter of Llewellyn's marriage to Joan. But many historians, particularly Welsh historians, believe that, uh, that Gladys Thee was a daughter of Llewellyn's relationship with Tanguistel Goch. If that was the case, Gladys was full sister to Griffith. And so you can see the uh, events of 1241 going along the lines of Sanana desperate to secure the release of her husband uh, from captivity, uh, turns to her brother-in-law, Ralph Mortimer, uh, for his support in that, and also turns to her son, Llewellyn, and says, look, I'm, you know, I'm trying to secure your father's release. Can you do your bit? And we're allying with the Mortimers, our relatives, and can you therefore quick claim your lands uh, to them? So there are inklings in the 1240s that the two families may well have been working mm. closely together. Uh, but of course, that was then sundered in 1256 because Llewellyn broke his oath because uh, he had quick claimed uh, Guarafuni on in 1241, uh, and that then set events on a different trajectory. But yes, as you say, it's interesting that in 1281, it comes full circle, mm. and they make, and Chloe and Roger make this pact of mutual support. I, I wonder who initiated that. Do you think it was uh, Roger Mortimer Sr., or do you think it came from Llewellyn, or did it suit them both? Presumably suited them both. Um, yes, I, I, th I think it possibly suited them both. Um, it, uh, I suspect, my, my feeling would be that it may well have been initiated by uh, Llewellyn, because at this stage he perhaps needed uh, that support more than Roger Mortimer did, um, because uh, as, you, as you explained in your talk, Sean, uh, by 1281, uh, Llewellyn is, is very much, uh, his influence is very much restricted. Um, so it may well be that he, he was in more need uh, of that support than Roger Mortimer was, mm. um, but it potentially suited. Um, and again, going back to Joanna's uh, questions that Joanna posed about when, it, when was it that the Mortimers um, began to sort of touch upon the Arthurian legacy. Um, and yes, Roger Mortimer uh, had organized a round table event, sort of, uh, which is seen as his sort of part of his retirement from public life and the occasion of the knighting of, of his sons. Um, and so, yes, it just it poses the question mm. as to whether in going in, towards the end of his life, going back to a pact with Llewellyn, he's beginning to touch on that Mortimer legacy. Mm. Mm. Um, we mentioned the um, tournament and the round table at Nevin on the Clean Peninsula and Archbishop Peckham writes to the Bishop of Bangor and says, I'm not having this, stop it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Archbishop Peckham is by then on his way to St. David's, uh, where he stopped by Thomas Beck and said, no, 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 you, you've got no metropolitan status here. But anyway, just before he gets to St. David's, he writes to the Bishop Bangor and, and says, no tournament. And presumably this comes back to the prophecy, the non-Christian element yeah. of Arthur. Uh, yeah, but back in 1241, it was it was Richard Bishop of Bangor, Anian's predecessor, who was uh, a, a really keen on, on Griffith and then his son Llewellyn, 
who was, uh, I think, passing um, uh, offers to uh, Henry. Uh, and, and these are recorded by uh, Matthew Paris. And uh, another point to make is Llewellyn is um, stuck in Dufferin Cluid, I think about 1241, 1242, 1243. So he's got no military presence to take on Ralph Mortimer. Okay, the, there are still more questions um, from the chat, <laughs> but I'm conscious of neglecting people in the audience. Um, are the, th does anybody in the audience want to join in the discussion, ask any questions, or shall I go back to the ones on the chat? Okay. Uh, why, why did Richard III never produce the princes to offset rumours of their death? Uh, which in part you've possibly uh, uh, answered already, Matt. Uh, there's a sort of supplementary to that, um, which, which I'd also like to comment on, uh, which is that uh, maybe the Yorkists went against Richard because of their because of the prince's assumed murder, um, and so there, and so he would have solidified uh, his base, and so he would have solidified his base if he had been able to uh, produce the princes uh, and prove that they were not dead. I think why Richard wouldn't produce the princes goes back to what I tried to talk about in my talk a little bit, that the point of people knowing where they were was that it made them targets for abduction. And if the plan was to keep them secret, then you kind of have to make that decision and ride it out. And it may have been easy to produce them, but it might, might well have caused more problems than it solved when they become targets for abduction. And I think in terms of people turning against Richard, Again, and I think this plays into this idea of hindsight and, and joining together dots that aren't necessarily joined together in a straight line. We assume that people turn against Richard because they think he might have killed the princes in the tower. But that overlooks a lot of Richard's political policy, which went to drive out the corruption of his brother's reign. So he comes to the, the throne in 1483 on a strong anti-corruption ticket, saying that his brother's reign was, was dodgy, corrupt, all of this bad stuff happened, and I'm going to make sure everything changes. And this really continues a thread that we see in him as Duke of Gloucester in the north of England, where he really does seem to have an interest in equity and fairness and championing the lot of the common man further down the social ladder. And I think to some extent, people in London think, well, that's great when it's the, the king's brother mucking around up north and no one cares what happens up north. But he's going to try and do this on a national scale. We're not having that. So the people that turn against Richard, the ones that flee to Henry Tudor's court in exile, are that kind of middle layer of shire gentry who were doing very well out of corruption under Edward the Fourth reign and are finding their path to corruption now being shut down. Uh, and I think Richard's political interest probably alienated people more than any concern for the princes in the tower. We tend with hindsight, we think everything that happened in Richard III's reign is about the princes in the tower. I simply don't think people thought about them that much. Well, and, and I think another um, aspect of that um, is that in a sense um, the Yorkist the Yorkist faction had been sundered uh, even before that? Uh, I mean, I know sort of Jana has touched on this as well. And there's a, a book, which I think probably due out fairly soon by Steve, Stephen David, uh, which develops this this argument, um, but in, in in very simple terms. Uh, uh, I mean, Joanna referred before to the importance of the whole of the Mortimer legacy to Richard, Duke of York, uh, not just um, uh, the claim to the throne, but the wealth that the Mortimers brought. Um, you have to remind me, Joanna, because uh, I keep ascribing this to you wrongly, because you, although I ascribe this to you, you actually quote it from somebody else, uh, that the Duchy of York was uh, indebted to, uh, to the previous Duke of York's gambling and to the e existing dowagers, um, which you, you quote in Cecily, uh, but I think you quote it from somebody else, that the Duchy of York, the Duchy of York itself uh, was mortgaged up to the hock and was in debt. Yeah. Burdened uh, with debt and dowagers. Yes. And I think it was T.B. Pugh who said that. Yes, T.B. Pugh. Uh, yeah. And, and so therefore, uh, all of Richard Duke of York's wealth came from his Mortimer inheritance. 
And a key part of that inheritance was the loyalty of the Mortimer gentry and retainers who had served the House of Mortimer for centuries and when and, and transferred that loyalty to Richard, Duke of York, because lordship is personal. And with Richard establishing uh, his household in York, in, in Ludlow, uh, then that loyalty of the Mortimer retainers transferred to Richard, Duke of York. When he placed his eldest son, Edward, to be brought up in Ludlow, then that retained the loyalty of the Mortimer faction. When Edward IV, in turn, placed his eldest son, the young Prince Edward, to be brought up in Ludlow, then similarly, uh, the, support, the support of the old Mortimer retainers and gentry transferred to Edward V. And so, in large part, the success of Richard and then Edward in claiming and Edward in securing the throne came from the support from the Welsh marches. Richard, though, didn't have that same base in the Welsh marches. And just the accident of history, in terms of how things worked out, when, uh, Ed, when Edward V did not succeed to the throne, then that fractured that base of support. And I think somebody has used the phrase that the Battle of Bosworth was not a battle between Lancaster and York, but between two factions of Yorkists. Yeah, I think you can see Edwardian Yorkists and Ricardian Yorkists fighting each other at Bosworth. And Henry Tudor is just kind of there looking to pick up the pieces at the end of it to some extent. He doesn't have, he has no natural support whatsoever. Mm. And from the point, and from a Mortimer point of view, Mortimer point of view, much of that Edwardian uh, Yorkist support is the old Mortimer uh, support that had happily transferred to Richard and then to Edward. And it was then just fractured. Yeah, and as I think I tried to mention, you know, I think part of that is the the ruining of long term plans. So people had put their sons in the households of Edward V, assuming that he was going to be the next king. They made all of those connections, and they believed that that would bring them wealth and power. And as soon as he doesn't succeed, all of that is broken. All of their plans are shattered, and they now have no connection to the to the new king whatsoever. So perhaps one of the big faults of Richard is not recognizing that. You know, he essentially sends Buckingham as Viceroy into Wales and hands over the, the vacancy left by Edward V to Buckingham, which I think to some extent was a huge mistake. And, and that alienated not just you know, chunks of Wales and things, but it, it alienated that core Mortimer support. There was a reason that his dad based himself here at Ludlow, and it's because the Duchy of York, as we said, was bankrupt, but its lands were also disparate. They were spread all over the place. It was the marcher... Mortimer inheritance that gave Richard Duke of York a solid single block of power from which to operate with Ludlow at its core. And I think Richard managed to overlook the fact that he needed to do something to bring that with him when he became king, because their, their belief in what was going to happen in 1483 was, was fractured and he never repaired it. Thanks, Matt. Um, so jump, jumping around, um, there's a, just, this is just picking up on the sort of conversation about Llewellyn. Uh, somebody just commented that um, arguably Llewellyn did not want to go to war in 1282. Uh, it was his brother Daffif who started the fighting by attacking Harden while Llewellyn was awaiting the birth of his first child. Uh, and yes, I, 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 mean, uh, I think, Sean, that's quite clear, isn't it, that it was initiated by Daffif uh, and Llewellyn was given a choice that he had no choice but to join in uh, because if he hadn't, he would have been ceding primacy to his brother, for, with whom he'd always had a fractious uh, relationship. Yeah, so David attacked um, Harden Castle at Easter 1282. Um, I think most historians uh, assume that this took by, Llewellyn by surprise because Eleanor is, is due to give birth, and of course she, she dies in, in childbirth in June. Um, and... Uh, uh, we've seen that uh, Llewellyn is, is very much diminished post the Treaty of Aten Um So I, he's got to make a choice. Um, and uh, Edward offers, offers him a lordship in, in England. Uh, and he says, no, you know, uh, Edward wants uh, Snowdonia, Uriri, and uh, he offers him a lordship in England. No, he doesn't want it. But he doesn't want the war, I don't think, in 1282. 
it's not going to benefit him no. in any way, shape or form. No, but, it, but Daffy's actions left him with no choice because mm. uh, had Daffy's rebellion been successful, uh, then Daffy would have become ruler of Wales. Well, uh, uh, of course, David is in the four cantrevs, so he's over uh, his base is Hope Castle, mm. and uh, he's attacking hard, and so he's well towards the, yes. the, the English border, whereas Llewellyn is still in the heartland yes. of Gwyneth across yes. the Conway. Yeah, but once the rebellion has started, uh, Llewellyn has to join in. Uh, mm, yeah, well, he chooses to. He chooses yeah, to, yeah, but, it, but... I it, think very reluctantly. Yeah, yes. Um, but yes, it's, he's left in the, what, an impossible decision. You know, mm. Again, a theme that uh, throughout the day, uh, people having to being faced with impossible decisions yes. uh, and you know, making a decision on what's in front of them and not knowing what the consequences are going to be. Yeah. Well, he's, see, he's seen the power of Edward's administration, military and otherwise. He's seen the castles going up at Ridland and Flint. So I, I really don't think he wants war in 1282. Mm. Okay. Uh, okay, lady down here. So I'll unwrap my legs. Try and get down the steps without tripping over. Uh, yeah, going back to this hindsight thing, and talk, going to Edward II and Isabella and Roger Mortimer um, being lovers or in there. People don't actually really, Roger had a family over here. You know, his wife was here. He got 12 children. Yeah. So was he looking to put them into some sort of position? You know, any one of those? I mean, it goes on to what Matt was saying about putting people in as well, you know, bringing, bringing the Mortimers in, into the royal family as such, you know, I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's just, um, I was just discussing this with Philip yesterday, actually, that I personally find the relationship of Roger Mortimer, the first Earl of March with his wife, Joan Genville, actually far more interesting than his supposed, you know, great love affair with, with Queen Isabella, because they were married for, for 30 years, they had 12 children together. And as Philip was saying to me yesterday, that it's clear that they did have a very uh, close relationship, you know, Joan always went to Ireland with him, and the frequency of her childbearing would, would seem to indicate that they had a, a close, intimate relationship and spent a lot of time together. And yet, so there were four boys and eight girls, and so Roger used uh, his opportunity as Queen Isabella's favourite co-ruler, whatever you want to call him, to arrange in a really great marriages for his daughters. Like, you know, they married, one of them married the Earl of Warwick, one was the Earl of Pembroke, one married um, Edward II's nephew, the, the Earl of Norfolk there, although he died young, so nothing really came of that. But, you know, when you were the medieval noble father of eight daughters, then, you know, you kind of had like, had a lot of good marriages to arrange for them. So I think, you know, that's an element as well, you know, so for between 1323 and 1326, Roger was stuck on the continent, you know, as I said, you know, basically little more than a penniless, powerless fugitive. Uh, and then realized that, you know, oh, Queen Isabella's there, her son is there, you know, she's discontented with, with her husband who's allowed her his uh, co-ruler to you know to shove her out of power you know maybe I, I can use that as leverage you know you know maybe I'm just being a bit cynical I just think it's a, you know it's a more realistic way of looking at their relationship that they were just trying to use each other rather than oh they just fell madly in love and then you know they just happened to rule England for the next four years just by sheer chance you know I'm, I'm far too cynical to believe that sorry all right Yeah. Yes, and of, and of course, another point is that, yeah, that, that's an important point, Karen, yeah, that, that there were other exiles on the continent, like John Maltravers, actually, who was uh, Roger, uh, Edward II's custodian in 1327, was one of the exiles, you know, Thomas Rosselin was another, William Trussell, there were quite a few of them, and uh, what we do find in the chancery rolls in 1326 is that Edward II is saying that Queen Isabella is allying with Roger Mortimer and the other exiles. Now, Roger Mortimer is always named, but he always is after he escaped from the tower because he was the, the highest ranking of the English exiles. So it's always Roger Mortimer and the other exiles. So then when we can see that, that's just following the pattern. But a lot of modern writers have just ignored the bit that says, and the other exiles. And they're saying, oh, yeah, Queen Isabella's allying with Roger Mortimer. You know, she, she must be in love with him. Yeah. OK. Uh, right, sorry, just one, one more question, and then I think we will we'll need to uh, draw things to a close. 
really just following on from that, one thing that really interests me is the relationship between Isabella and Jean de Jeanville, you know, that the, the relationship between them, particularly obviously after Roger was executed. Yeah. Because I believe that they got on quite well. I don't think there's anything to show that they were they were actually hostile to each other. Um, I think, you know, I, f I find, I suppose, relationships like that, like, quite fascinating. And, and it's unfortunately the kind of thing that we don't often have evidence for in the 14th century. Like, how did people feel about, you know, in that kind of relationship, that kind of situation or, you know, what, what was their opinion? But... Um, yeah, I, I found I found Joan a very likable person. You know, she lived to the age of seventeen. You know, she outlived Roger by twenty six years and seemed to have been faithful to his memory. Although it does seem that um, that while he was Queen Isabella's co ruler, that he and Joan didn't really have much of a relationship. I guess you know Roger was at court all the time, and Joan seemed to stay well in, in Ludlow, I guess essentially, which is of course was her own inheritance that she brought to to the Mortimer family. Um, now, I, yeah, unfortunately, Queen Isabella kind of fades into obscurity after her downfall in October 1313. So we don't know all that much about her. For, and then she lived for another 28 years and Joan lived for another 26 years. You know, so they they both both ladies lived for quite a long time. Um, so only Isabella's household accounts survived for the last few months of her life. And I don't think that in those accounts. Oh, actually, no, Joan would have been dead by then anyway. She died 1356. So I would be actually really interested to know if they had any contact with each other and how they felt about each other. Yeah, it would be fascinating. Yeah. Okay, so just uh, one more. If we could just go back to that one slide. One, one comment to read, I'd like to read out just to, to close uh, proceedings for the day. Um, so uh, the comment starts, this is following uh, what Sean and I were saying about the relationship between Roger Mortimer uh, and Khawali Nap Griffith. Um, so it, the message is, thank you very much, Philip and Sean and others, for that very detailed answer. Thank you all for the wonderful information in all of your talks, and thank you all for bringing these families into the light. A wonderful and fascinating day. Thanks also to Catherine, Matt and Joanna and Sean. And thank you so much for holding this event. Absolutely great day. Cheers. So I, could, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, and just to add uh, my sort of thank, again, thanks to uh, the four speakers, uh, but also uh, my thanks to you for coming to my rescue. Uh, in this uh, impromptu session, uh, which I think has gone quite well. <laughs> so thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for coming, for attending, whether in the auditorium here uh, or attending via Zoom at home. Uh, those who are here, wish you a safe journey home and look forward to seeing you at the end of November for our, our event on writing historical fiction. Thanks very much.